Across Britain, there's a hidden network of canals, more than 2,000 miles long. Many of them cut through some of the most stunning scenery. And in this series, I've chosen eight canal trips, the very best, from the west coast of Scotland to the southwest of England. I'm going to take part, aren't I? <laughs> I'll be exploring their stories. Am I helping? Discovering why and how they were built. A spectacular piece of engineering. And looking at their impact as Britain moved into the industrial age. On this trip, I'm going to be exploring part of the amazing labyrinth of canals in the West Midlands, the beating heart of Britain's canal network. I'll be delving into the past to answer the question, why did the name Birmingham come to mean quality, excellence and good value? I'll be trying to buy some guns and end up in a hidden cavern underground, enough to excite any James Bond villain. I'm in Worcestershire, on my way to Birmingham, the middle of the country, and in canal terms, the centre of the world, the network hub. There are more canals in Birmingham than there are in Venice. All these canals go into the city. It's a bit of a knotty problem, but I'm sure I can sort it out. I'm starting off on this trip near the village of Alva Church, just 16 miles south of Birmingham. And I'll be making my way right into the centre of the city. But I'll need some help from my expert skipper, Lester State. That's a bit of a close one, isn't it? it well done. Very close. <laughs> <laughs> Off we go to Birmingham, and it'll all soon be very... It's sort of industrial. It'll be very, very different indeed. Hello, good morning. We're going ahead now, if you don't mind. I find it valuable on occasion to speak to animals firmly in English. Sometimes they won't listen. It's beautiful, isn't it? Wherever we are, there's the canal and the fields. If you said to people, oh, here we are, near Birmingham, <laughs> you wouldn't believe it, would you? That's it's right. So beautiful. Just a few miles away from the city centre of Birmingham, and you've got this beautiful countryside. Yeah. But this is the way to see it, though, isn't it? From the canal, you can get the full force. It is a force of the English countryside in summer. It just looks... it just looks fabulous. Fantastic. Mm. What an idyllic scene. Should be on a chocolate box. Hold on, we're already here. Bourneville, the home of Cadbury's chocolate. It's been here for ages. Mr. Cadbury needed the canal to bring cocoa from the ports, milk from the local farms, and the milk tray? I've no idea. Cadbury called it Bourneville. Sounds French. Give it a bit of class. You could say milk tray bon. Right, well, thanks very much. We'll see you later. OK, John. OK. Bye for now. George Cadbury didn't want his workers simply stuffing themselves with chocolate buttons and curly whirlies. So he provided them with a healthy place to live. Gillian Ellis looks after the estate at Bourneville. By 1900, it was a flourishing company town with everything provided. He was the man with the plan, wasn't it? Yes, he believed that if he gave his workers decent homes, decent gardens, shops, communities, open spaces, they'd be happier, they'd be healthier. They'd be more motivated to do a better day's work and be more productive for him, yes. I should imagine a lot of present-day factory workers would think, if only, if only I could live in a place like this. I think I would agree with you there, yeah. yes. I think people would think that. I mean, in a way, it was, it was better in those days. Yes, I think it probably was. Yeah. Of course, all this came at a price. Everyone knew their place. The big houses went to the top brass. Still, it all looks very nice today. So here we've got all the shops that a community would need. News agents, bakers, butchers, toy shops, flower shop, everything you need. But what about pubs? Oh no, Cadbury was a Quaker and wouldn't allow them. But exercise, you could have as much as you like. This is the Cadbury factory. You can see we've got a fantastic expanse of the factory and dining block. And then to the right here we've got 
a fantastic sports pavilion that George built. This scene was famous, wasn't That's it? That's right, they used it for advertising their chocolate. Even I can remember that, young as I am, I can remember that. A different world. A different world. But what happened to the bloke who used to ski down the Matterhorn, climb through a window with the curtain blowing, all because some woman fancied chocolates? What happened to him? Welcome aboard, John. Uh, yes, thank you. I could have done that instead of that bloke. Right, here we go. Admittedly, not as glamorous, perhaps not as fast, but if she wanted chocolates, I could have brought them in a narrowboat. And not just one box of milk tray, I could have given her 20 tons of the stuff. We're heading from Bourneville into the centre of Birmingham, the heart of Britain's canal network. The fortunes of Birmingham were made by its canals. With no natural resources or raw materials, everything had to be brought in from outside the city. But once the first canal was begun, over 20 others soon followed, making up a huge waterway network connecting with the rest of the country. Birmingham overtook Venice in the length of its canals, 174 miles in all. The Italians had gondolas, ice creams, and some of the finest Renaissance buildings in the world. But Birmingham had locks, a few tunnels, and one of the most distinctive regional accents on Earth. Also, unlike most canals, here there are signposts. Look at this, we've got three canals joining up here. You see what the problem was for the canal builders to bring all these together. And we had the same problem in our day because this road is the M6 and this is Spaghetti Junction. Known as the Liquid Way, canals link Birmingham to the whole country. If they were in a real hurry, narrow boats could reach London in three days and nights, and Lancashire in two. For quite a short period of around 50 years, canals were the answer to Britain's transport problems. For cities such as Birmingham, it was boom time. The population doubled. In recent years, Birmingham's had to try hard to put some of the glamour back into the gloom. So this is really the start of canal development. They've cleaned it up. Oh. Looks good. It's magnificent. Birmingham decided that the centre of their city would become more exciting, more fashionable, if they made a feature of their canal system. And they're now proud of it. That's fine, John. You can put it in neutral now. The famous Gas Street Basin, one of the first areas to get the newfangled gas lighting system, is where two of the canal companies were locked in conflict. No boat could pass. They didn't want to share their canals, let alone the water in them. A solid barrier was built. It became a clash of the titans. Pig-headed? Yes. I'd call it narrow-minded. Hello. Hello, John. I think the weather's going to be kind to us. It better be. <laughs> Anyway, you're going to show us around. I'd be delighted to. Historian and author Graham Fisher gives me the background. Well, this is the uh, famous Worcester Bar. It was a physical barrier between the Worcester and Birmingham Canal and the fledgling Birmingham Canal Navigation uh, Company. Right. And the actual bar itself still exists. You can see where the boats are moored there. There is a physical barrier. Why did they do that? Why do they want to stop the traffic coming down here, not just going straight on through? Water was a precious commodity that the uh, companies didn't want to lose. It was their lifeblood. I think that's what, what people are surprised about, that you think all this water, we've got plenty of water, it rains, that's OK. <laughs> but canals leak, don't they? They, they, they leak. They leak and you need to keep topping them up. There's an awful lot of usage. Off. So eventually they saw sense and you then could come from here Right the way through? Right the way through. But that took, what, until 1815? 1815, yes. <laughs> right, right. That's good. We've got the old and the new here, haven't Absolutely. We? What a wonderful juxtaposition. Yeah. Behind us, we have the Worcester and Birmingham Canal. Ahead, the main line of the Birmingham Canal Navigations. And around us, this wonderful blend of the old and the new, some of which has survived for over 200 years and some of which has sprung up in the last 30 years. Well, it's terrific. Absolutely yeah. fabulous. Yeah. I'm glad you like so it. So it's, it's, no, it's, it's jolly good. 
The Gas Street Basin would once have teemed with activity, with goods coming in from all over the country. Birmingham became one of the workplaces of the world, the city of a thousand trades and about a billion bricks. It's been a long day, time for some refreshment. Just one Cornetto? Perhaps not. Um, I was hoping to order a takeaway, is that okay? Well, a ball tea would be nice. Medium, I think. Better be on the safe side. Uh, I think we're a large bottle, don't you think? Hello, sir. From Hello. Hello. Thanks very much. Thank you, sir. of Britain's canal system. Canals made Birmingham, and Birmingham made almost everything else. Now I can sit here quietly sipping my, what's it called? Cappuccino, Americano, flat white, flat cap, I don't know. But 200 years ago, this would have been busy, busy, busy. A greater variety of products were made here than in any other city in the world. I'm off to look at one of them. Wesley Richards is one of the finest gun makers in Britain. They've been making guns here for over 200 years. Anthony Aubrey Tregear is a director of the company. This is terrific. How important was the gun industry to Birmingham? It was hugely important. I mean, it made up the whole industry here. Gun makers, cutlers, everybody involved in the arms industry, supplying the military, the empire, everything. It was huge, massive. How important was the canal network to produce that effect? That was very important indeed, because there were no raw materials here in Birmingham. So everything had to come into this industrial heartland to actually manufacture these goods to then send back out again via the canals to the ports, export out around the rest of the empire. Guns were big business. In the run-up to the Battle of Waterloo, millions of guns were made here, two-thirds of all those used by the British Army. Everything here is precision made by hand, perfecting skills passed on from generation to generation. Made in Birmingham meant quality and innovation. Wesley Richards invented several of the key advances in gun making. This was one of the very first locking mechanisms to actually lock a gun shut. Right. Based on the top lever and this locking system here. OK, right. So there we are. Bang. Right. And and so the rear trigger. There's so that's barrel. the first one, so I've missed that. Yeah, you've missed that. <laughs> but I've got another chance, so... Exactly. Bang! We've definitely got it now, haven't we? Yeah, excellent. Whatever it is, pour yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Most of what we do today is for show, it's for yeah. people who are collecting sort of artisans' skilled work. They're probably a strange lot, aren't they? They are, yes, and they're a, a strange, wealthy lot, is what I would probably say. I think I could be one of those clients. I could do with these, um, because these are for binoculars, aren't they? That's correct, yes, they are. And I'll need to be able to see what I'm shooting. Yeah. yeah this looks terrific. Yeah, nice piece, that. Huh? Yeah, so... I like the look of that. Do you? Yeah, perfect. Really? This here is a very traditional Wesley Richards 20-gauge shotgun. Yeah. And could I hit something with this? That's all down to the man behind it, I have to say. Oh, right. And how much would this be? That's about 45. 45? Yeah, moving along here, we have a um, very nice rifle of ours, takedown, again, something that might suit you. Yeah. That's 70. Here we have an alligator case here, alligator-covered case. Alligator? Yeah, and inside exhibition-grade shotguns. You're looking at 150 for that pair. And then we have this one here. Note the diamonds in there. Diamonds? Diamonds. It's a treasure chest. It's an absolute piece of art. And how much would this cost? 250 250 Yeah, yeah. Well, um, I think I'd like all of them. Oh, well, fantastic. Well, you're looking about five, five fifteen. so if we say half a million? Half, uh, half a million pounds. Half a million pounds, yeah. Birmingham's firepower was essential in making and expanding the empire. Trade followed the flag, 
and the whole enterprise provided big business for Birmingham. Keeping it all going was a stream of inventions. One of the most remarkable innovators was a company called Bolton and Watt. Well, the wind's behind us now. It is, too. <laughs> We're doing all right. Their name would be stamped on one of the greatest inventions of the age. I'm going to see where their factory stood. This is the tiny entrance is, yes. from the canal to take boats into the foundry, isn't it? Hello. Andrew Lound is a historian who's helped preserve the Bolton and Watt archives. For a time, this was the only steam engine manufacturer in the world, is yes, that right? Yes, it was. From 1796 when it opened, for a long period of time, this was the principal works on the planet for manufacturing steam engines. Isn't that extraordinary? Oh, it's quite fantastic. So really. this is one of the great sites of the Industrial Revolution. This is the site that gives the Industrial Revolution the power, the energy to drive itself forward. And that was the critical part of it. And the man behind that, well, he's, the genius? He is James Watt. James the Watt. The great James Watt himself. Now, he is the man. That's when we talk about light bulbs. Yes. And we talk about how many watts. Yes, it's, it's James him. Watt. James Watt could not only see the bright future for machines, he could build them. I have invented certain new methods of steam engines to thereby give motion to wheels of mills and other machines. These engines replace water, wind and horse, and they are placed wherever it is most convenient for the manufacturer. The people of London, Manchester and Birmingham are steam mill mad. Bolton Watt and Sons opened the Soho foundry. And it's no exaggeration to say, this is where history was made. Watt's genius was the driving force. Without him, the engineering revolution could have taken a generation longer. Watt's steam engines were transported from his factory along the canals and out to the world. At the same time, raw materials streamed back into Birmingham. Coal, iron ore, and limestone. Limestone was vital, and much of it was mined here, just northeast of Birmingham, at Dudley. Beneath Castle Hill lies a vast labyrinth of limestone mines, which were connected to the canal. Once the stone has been dug out, it just has to be heated to produce quicklime. This unique part of Birmingham's canal system has become an attraction and is managed by Sarah Fellows. Yes, yeah. <laughs> you want to show me? Yeah? Absolutely, yeah, yeah. Okay. It's very small, isn't it? It is, yes. You can't take a normal canal boat through our tunnel. Uh, you have to take one of our special trip boats. And this would have been the start of a very long day, wouldn't it? A very long day, yeah. They'd come down here in the mornings when it was dark. They'd come back out at night when it was dark and they'd never see the sunshine. An incredible amount of hard work. Yeah, I mean, they, the only light they had was camels and they were expensive, so you just wouldn't use them. You'd just walk through the dark. At last, we've come through the first stretch of the tunnel and now it's, it's nice, isn't it? Come on, feel that. We're in paradise. <laughs> it's terrific. Yeah, this is Shirtsmore Basin, which is one of the open basins on the canal. It would have been a cavern originally with a roof, uh, but because they mined too close to the surface, it became unstable, so they had to bring the roof down and it became this sort of open um, space. Because they've taken all the limestone from there. This next basin is my favourite. This is Castle Mill Basin. You can forget you're in Dudley when you're down here. Yeah, it's wonderful, isn't it? This may not be one of the seven wonders of the ancient world, but it's pretty good for Dudley. It's hanging in there. Isn't it it's strange how these things are built for a completely different purpose? Look so beautiful. Hanging gardens. Yes, the hanging gardens of Dudley. Yeah. <laughs> now, this looks real dark, all of this dug out, so all the lime removed, and then as they've moved the limestone, they're just working their way into the hillside, aren't they? Yeah, all the tunnels are here just to bring the limestone out. Our final destination largest remaining cave, the so-called Singing Cavern. Oh, good 
Good morning, Mr. Bond. You are a little bit late. <laughs> you have arrived in time now to see the whole system at work. What a theatre, a natural theatre. A fantastic place to perform, yeah. It's I feel an urge already. <laughs> Mining here finished about a hundred years ago. This is terrific. But the cavern, with its superb acoustics, lives on as a popular venue for concerts. This is terrific. And this is where there's a performance, isn't there, that you come on here? Yes, we have uh, shows here throughout the year, and uh, our next one is an Edwardian music hall. And are you taking part in that? I am, yes. If I go to the opera house in the opera season, there's someone sure to shout at me. the perfect end of our canal trip. And what a great trip. We've unraveled the city's waterways and discovered, yes, Britain's new Venice. <laughs> <laughs>